And we are live with Shavar Jeffries, one of the smartest people that I know, president of Democrats for Education Reform, Sharp Brother. I have known Shavar now, I want to say probably, I don't know, eight years or so, seven, eight years. Um, and in the time, have been able to watch him as a shining example of, this is what I'm going to say, Sydney Portiesque. Uh, type of poise in all situations. Never oh, wow. goes crazy, never does anything, you know, just can keep his composure in any situation. I love it. Shavar, thank you for joining us this morning, brother. My pleasure, brother. First of all, if I'm one of the smart people, you know, we got to get you to know more people. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm not, I'm not all, I try to do my best, but I'm just grateful to be with you, brother. And obviously you're one of the most, um, one of the frankly great writers of our time, as far as I'm concerned. I mean, your writing is always packed with power and insight and, you know, just, just your passion for our kids, for our community, racial justice. It's always a blessing to see you, man. I'm honored to be on your show, my brother. Well, I appreciate all of that. Um, for our listeners, let you know, um, we're having a little bit of a slight delay. So if you notice that in our conversation today, that's what's going on. We have a slight internet delay, but we're going to make the most of it. Uh, I appreciate Shabar taking the time to be with me today. Shavar, you know, to start with, I just want to see if you can help us make sense politically where we're at with the democratic education agenda and the outlook. Like the, I framed this show in terms of uh, what's the democratic plan for excellence and equity. So we could have a lot of different plans for funding or for other parts of the education system. But if Democrats are, are the ones leading, um, say this time next year, what would you hope was the democratic version of how we achieve excellence and equity in education? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so I'll talk about what I think it should be. And then I'm sure we'll have a conversation about um, you know, the politics of the moment and what may be likely. Um, what I think it should be is, is, is multifaceted. Um, first, um, and this builds upon the work of many Democrats for a long period of time. You know, we've always had this conversation within the Democratic Party um, around there's one group of advocates who focus very much on resources um, and funding uh, and investment. And of course, that's very, very important. Um, but then you have those of us who believe you need investments plus you need, you need resources plus results and plus, plus innovation. And so I think that conversation continues in the party. We see it. Uh, in the primary process, we're going to see it to uh, administration next year, which is, of course, what we what we hope will happen. Um, and so but at the foundation of it ought to be a real bold and ambitious vision for what young people can accomplish and who and who young people are. And they're really. It's their capacity. That ought to be reflected in. In this to count about three so our students are actually performing against those standards and that we then use that data to provide interventions to support young people to to fulfill their potential and also to frankly hold the system accountable uh, to doing all it can uh, to ensure that there's educational service that enables students to fulfill that potential uh, in addition we believe deeply in resource equity that not only that there ought to be significant investments but that we got to make sure the investments are going to those students who need them most which are oftentimes students of color low-income students uh, students who speak English as a second language and students with educational disabilities. Um, third, we believe passionately in public school choice. Uh, families deserve more options within public education. Um, kids are not widgets. Um, kids have different learning styles. And so we need a variety of different schools to meet uh, their needs. Um, it's also the case, you know, upper income, middle income families already have uh, the ability to make choices in, in terms of education options. We believe low income folks should have that same opportunity. And we know it brings competitive pressure on the system and it makes the system more accountable to parents and families and less uh, less so to, to politicians and bureaucrats. Um, fourth, we believe we got to reimagine teacher prep. Teachers, you know, consistently report that what they learned in graduate schools of ed didn't prepare them for the classroom. Um, we need to hold both the legacy providers more accountable for um, the clinical outcomes of their graduates and driving instruction in the classroom. And we need to make we need to facilitate, frankly, more competition in that space as well. Um, and we see a range of new uh, 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 graduate school of education providers in the space, programs like Relay, Urban Teachers and others. And also these programs tend to be more diverse, too. And we know it's very important to get more black and brown folks in front of uh, in front of our children. And then fifth, higher education. We believe higher education has to be made cheaper, fair and better. 
um, cheaper and more affordable uh, for families. Uh, we know so many low-income families and working families simply can't afford college. Fair for us means more equitable admissions. So whether it's the elimination of the legacy preference, um, cutting back on early decision where families got to agree to go to school even before they know what the financial aid package, obviously working families can't afford to do that. Um, uh, Reimagining some of the other um, barriers, you know, the SAT, if you got a few thousand dollars, you can pay for a tutor who'll basically guarantee you 200 points on SAT. Working families oftentimes can't afford that. Um, and just also pushing schools to admit their fair share of highly qualified first generation low income families. Many colleges uh, will rather admit, frankly, oftentimes a less qualified upper income uh, applicant than a highly qualified uh, working class or low income applicant because the upper income uh, family can afford to pay the full freight. Uh, and then finally, better in higher ed. Uh, we have many colleges where the completion rates are abysmally low. And just like we need accountability in K-12, we need that in higher ed too. So that's the vision we have. And that's what we think that ought to anchor, um, uh, you know, a Democratic or frankly, even Republican administration, but obviously we focus on within the party. And so that's what we think we ought to be doing going forward. It sounds like a lot. Um, I would ask about that. You started by saying, you'll tell me what you think it should be and what um, what you all uh, are proposed to be and what the political mathematics of the moment tell us could be challenging. So taking in now the politics of the moment, uh, what do you think actually is gonna be challenging about all of this agenda that you just laid out? And you laid out a lot that in my mind should not be um, controversial, but it might be. A lot of it might be. Right. What do you think are the challenges for what you just laid out on both sides, on the Democratic side and on the Republican side? What's the challenge to the um, to the agenda that you laid out? Yeah, I would say on the on the Republican side, um, they can be they, they they oftentimes drag their feet on the resource side of the equation. Oftentimes, um, they're a bit. Um, you know, um, penny pinching in, in terms of the investments that are made um, in public education. So we have to push on that side on it, as a sector. I mean, we obviously focus on pushing on the Democratic Party, but as a sector, we need to make sure Republicans are, are continuing to, to push on the investment side. Um, they oftentimes aren't as focused on equity as as folks on the Democratic side are. Um, yeah, they tend to have a strong federalism bent. So even to the extent resources are, are invested, um, it oftentimes is a blank check. Um, so they tend to be less willing for the Fed to impose restrictions on federal dollars we're talking about. So, um, you know, of course, we would argue with federal dollars, the Fed have every right uh, to demand certain types of um, outcomes, you know, with those dollars. On the Democratic side, you know, the resource part of the equation tends not to be the issue. Uh, the accountability uh, issue um, can often, is definitely a, a pitched uh, fight uh, within, within the party. Um, you know, particularly when that accountability means the adults in the buildings have to do something different. If it's accountability on parents or families or other actors, uh, that tends not to be as controversial. But when we say we're going to hold uh, school leaders, uh, uh, administrators, teachers um, accountable for the extent to which students are growing, that becomes a fight, largely because the teachers unions, which is you know one of the most, if not the most powerful political force in democratic politics, um, is strongly against um, you know that really kind of performance-based accountability for educators, and then of course then the other issue is public school choice. So public charter schools um, is also a space, a platform for very pitch fights within the party. Um, I would argue also likewise because you know the teachers union, which is very strong political force within the party, uh, two other issues that they have with the public charter school. Um, so I don't want to just make it about the politics of the teacher union, you know, although that's a big part of it. But yeah, I have some people who, you know, sincerely think uh, that that's not the best way to advance, uh, you know, education. So those are, I'd say, the, 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 the ways in which on the Republican side, the Democratic side, there's definitely some controversy and there's going to be some political fights on many of these issues. Yeah, so you look to November. We have an election coming up. Election day comes, election day goes. Let's say that we have a president, uh, Joe Biden, and then we have a Biden-Harris administration. Joe Biden spent eight years in the Obama White House, and Obama's the Obama White House was probably one of the most um, progressive education reform um, presidencies ever. And um, he was open to a wide array of things. He put more resources into the schools. He strengthened uh, the schools at a time when they had holes in their budget and everything was about to collapse. 
I was on a school board at the time. I remember our district getting that savior money from from DC at a time where we had a huge hole in the middle of our budget and it was going to come down to laying off a bunch of teachers. So um, so he put a lot of money into the schools and then he put a lot of uh, competition and accountability also. So he had the full program going on um, and that's where Biden was for eight years. Um, and Harris, uh, you know, in California, she was very supportive of, um, I don't know if you know this, but San Francisco uh, County Sheriff's Department is the first sheriff's department in the country to have a charter school that works with like 40 community groups to make sure that uh, while you are in juvenile hall, you're not being incarcerated, you're being educated while you're in. And then when you get out, you're not left alone. So they have a complete kind of handoff system and it's a charter school. It was a it was a ground it's award winning, groundbreaking, uh, community loved school that um, doesn't treat kids as throwaways, but treats them as um, as students, as people. And I only bring that up to say you have two people who could possibly be in the presidency oh, uh -huh. and the vice presidency who have been agreeable to um, choice, more options, a broader look at education. Um, but what's the real politics that happens now? Because that was then. That's the past. <laughs> so help me understand, you know, like where we are now with them specifically. Yeah. Well, we'll see where we are with them. I mean, the Democratic Party platform um, has become uh, uh, worse on on these issues of progressive education reform. Uh, so with President Obama, we had uh, who is really our model um, and our paradigm for what we believe as, as Democrats. Uh, We have President Obama. Uh, the platform uh, was much more uh, open to these ideas, was much embraced these ideas in a much more significant way. We've seen in 16 and now in 20, uh, the platform be much more skeptical, uh, particularly on the issues of choice and accountability. Um, so many of the other issues I talked about, uh, the platform is pretty solid. Um, but in terms of choice and accountability, um, the Democratic Party platform in 16 and now even worse in 20 um, is much more skeptical. Um, on choice, there's language in the platform which is Folks, we're having a little bit of trouble. Cointel Pro is in action this morning. It looks like we're having a little bit of trouble with our um, internet uh, this morning. So I think uh, Shafar will probably jump back on. Okay, am I, am uh, I still with you, brother? Now you're back again. Yep, you were gone. I was just explaining to folks that we're having a little bit of internet uh, difficulty today, but you're back. You're back. Are you there? Can you hear us? Come back in. All right. Well, we're going to let him out. He's going to log out, come back in again. Um, it gives me a chance to go through the uh, the comments here, see what people have said so far. Hmm. Um, so we got good mornings from Toya and Elaine and Tashir, Cosby, Lucy Arias um, says that she thinks that we should be investing resources in innovation. And I imagine that you mean that as a democratic plan for what we should have for um, for education. We've got the same hater from New York who likes to jump in with some phony Afrocentric nonsense and has a lot of heat and energy for anything that looks like an alternative to the mainline school system that was a instrument of social control for the ruling class and for white folks for years. But any alternative that comes up to that system is, is suspect and blah, 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 whatever. Yeah, no one here is saying that every charter school is good, but no one here is also buying the nonsense that there should only be one kind of school and one kind of system and that the mainline government system owns our children. So, Mott, I see you, bro. I see you in the in the comments. I see you with this this stuff that you're saying, you know, blah blah blah, whatever. And you come and do this every now and again, but you have no energy for the main system. You only have energy for brothers like me and and uh, Shavar when we're talking about any alternative to the bureaucratized, industrialized, unionized. Um, had too much time and your time is up to educate our kids school system. But yeah, you got all kinds of heat. And the fact that you wrap it What's up in on? some got, Newark Afrocentric 
you know, blah, blah, blah. Well, I mean, listen, we got this brother from Newark uh, who likes to jump in and uh -oh. talk about Who's how, this? you know, we're agents. It, it, his name is Mott Mize. I like the dude in some ways because I think, you know, he's got uh -huh. a good social media feed. What are we, what are we think, agents of now? So, what's, the cons what's the hotel conspiracy from this brother? Well, what the whole conspiracy is that we're we're agents of white supremacy and that oh, you hated white see. supremacy in New York, oh, okay. and I, you know, I'm like here, let, you know, me, yeah. you know, and this is the type of nonsense, though. I just want to like it's, we it's we foolish, can't be foolishness. some things you only want to take for response, right? We can't be to talk about North because stuff. yeah. Well, let me say this: a report just came out. I'm proud of everything I was a part of uh, in the city of Newark, and I can only speak about what I personally do. A, a report just came out about two weeks ago. That says that Newark is number one in the United States of America for what's called beat the odds schools. <clears throat> These are schools where uh, low income students uh, perform in their proficiency at a rate that outperforms state averages. So it's basically the idea of, you know, I mean, I don't like these odds because our kids are amazing. So I don't, I don't get into all the odds, but that's the framing they use. But it's basically the idea that um, uh, low income students, students see free or reduced lunch are outperforming state averages. Newark is number one. And that and that's because of the work that many of us did within the district and in the public charter schools, a whole multi sector effort. Uh, the public charter schools are a big piece of that. Um, they're not perfect, but they're doing a lot of great work to provide education opportunity for kids in North um, uh, and the district. You know, I was I was very proud. I was the president of the school board. I was on the school board for three years. We brought extended learning time programs with the district. We brought additional resources to our teachers. We paid our teachers $50 million more dollars. Um, we brought in new school models within the district, like Bard Early College, um, uh, 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 Newark Leadership Academy, Eagle Academy. The district, his, its graduation rates are going up. More kids are going to college out of the district, the same as in the charter school. We lead, we lead in the charter school sector. We lead the country in terms of that. And so the bottom line is the children are better off. And the reality is, whoever this person is, um, we had to disrupt the system because it, had it hadn't been working for 30, 40 years for our children. And that's just a fact. That's why when families have choice, they leave. Now they're coming back to the district, which I think is a beautiful thing because the district has begun to reform its practices. And so, you know, I mean, all this this foolishness of whoever this person is, I tend not to dignify with a response because it's a distraction um, and the data and the facts speak for itself. So I'm always happy to have a fact-based conversation. So whoever this person, if they want to have a fact. I mean, but this is kind of our problem, uh, Shavar, part of our problem I'm always happy to right be now. Proud of what we've done. You know, part of our problem on the Democratic side, though, is that we we don't always have a fact based conversation. We have an emotional, political um, debate that really that comes down to to, um, you know, old versus new union versus innovation, um, um, pensions versus versus people, um, you know, uh, policies that don't go anywhere. This is the Democratic problem, if I'm being real. And I'll, I'll be real for everybody here, too, by the way. I'm, I'm an independent. So, <laughs> like, you know, I, I have the option to step back mm -hmm. and look at everybody with an objective point of view. And I'm looking at Democrats and I'm thinking, what's the hope here? What's the what's the upside and what's the challenge? Right. So so uh, I think what you laid out in the beginning is yeah. I, I think, don't know how I you think can part of what that, we have. You know? Are you there? Again, we're having <laughs> more technical difficulties brought to you by Cointel Pro. Um, so I'm gonna go back to the um, to the comments just for a second uh, while Shavar uh, checks on his internet uh, again. Um, Kayla says, we can't expect one system to be all things to all children. And this is such a essential point for us to understand I don't understand any political platform that goes to a people and says, we're going to give you fewer options. We're going, we, we think you are the one population on planet earth that would do better to have fewer options. And we're going to take some off the table. And the one option that we're going to leave on the table is one that has harmed you for years and hasn't done well for you. Um, that doesn't make any sense as a political platform. It would be a shame. It would be a shame for Democrats if Republicans were the ones coming to people saying, we know you don't like our platform on everything else in the world, 
But on the one thing that's really important to you, your child and where your child goes to school, we're going to be the ones to offer you an additional option to the one that you're trapped into. It would be a shame if that was the Republican pitch to oppressed people and the Democrats were so dumb as to say, we're going to give you the entire teachers union platform. We're going to give you the platform designed by a nation of white teachers who come together and put their middle class interest ahead of all your interests. Um, that would be a shame if Republicans were the ones who were offering the oppressed uh, something that helped them be less oppressed. And Democrats were the ones saying you should have fewer options in education. Are you back with us, brother? Yeah, and I'm sorry, man. To well, take a quick vacation. And, uh, <laughs> I tried, I'm switched switch to my phone now. I'm in a hotel now. And maybe I don't have the best okay. connect. And, and Your it, phone's going to work better. I can tell I already. So, the LTE. Yeah. yeah, hopefully that'll work. Yeah. So, I think the phone's going to so work, especially if you paid your bill. I do pay it. I do pay All it. right, good. I, I was just going on a rant just now about, um, about just basics. Let's keep things simple and plain, right? The, the best older activist told you to talk plain to people. The plainest I can make it is you can't have one group of people coming to you saying, we want to offer you more options than you have right now. And have another group coming to you saying, we think the one option that you should have should be the only one. And it's one that hasn't served you very well for, for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. Those are two dumb. Those are two different sales pitches. Right. Mm -hmm. And it would be a shame if the one that was pitching you the ability to have more options in education was also the one who you disagreed with 90 percent of the rest of their agenda. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. right? Um, so, so I think where we were going with this was you were going to tell me about the reality of where we are right now, the politics, if we have a Biden-Harris win in November, mm -hmm. and then they come into the White House, they're going to set about doing a lot of other things. But in education specifically, what do you think uh, is the realistic forecast, not the optimistic one, but the realistic forecast of what they'll do first? What are they going to set about in education as their agenda from the get-go? Yeah, I think they're going to do a lot of great things around, um, which is very important, around um, the need for one-to-one -one internet access, um, given that there's going to be so much virtual learning. So I would anticipate there'll be a significant investment there. Um, I'm sure they're going to make a big investment to pay teachers more, um, which is important and which we absolutely support. Um, I'm sure they're going to make a very big investment to make college uh, free or at, at least very affordable. Probably be some efforts around canceling student debt. Um, I think they're going to make a significant investment in Title One in the, the Democratic Party platform talks about tripling Title One, so maybe almost sixty billion dollars. Uh, I think that's great. Um, so I think all of that is great. I mm -hmm. think where it's going to be more of an issue is 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 once you move beyond, beyond writing large checks and saying in exchange for the money we need some accountability, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, in exchange for the money we also want to see some innovation because it doesn't make sense for schools to keep looking like. Uh, today, how they look 40, 50 years ago. I think that's where there's going to be an issue. Now, on the choice issue, because I caught a piece of it in terms of where the Republicans are, it's very easy for Republicans to support choice because most of the choice programs don't affect their their, their districts, right? So I, they're, they're just, it's not any profile and courage for a Republican to, to support a choice program in, with, that deals with somebody else's children. And there is no counter for it. There is no organized opposition to public school choice and the Republican Party. So they have a total free hand. So I, we should be very clear about that. In fact, it's Democrats who've driven most of the growth in public charter schools in the face of significant political opposition. So whether it's people like President Obama or Antonio Villagrosa or Cory Booker or Adrian Fenty or Rahm Emanuel or many and many others we can talk about uh, throughout the country. So the Republicans don't to me, get any pat on the back. Uh, when they're talking about it, uh, it's not their district. Because the reality, there is disruption um, in the public charter school space. There's no question about that. I mean, if you have, you know, in our city, Newark, we've had we went from 20 years ago zero percent of kids in public charter schools because they didn't exist to 35 percent now. Mm -hmm. And so that that is that is resources that that used to be in the districts moving to the public charter sector. I think that's just what it has to mean because I believe families should be able to make those choices. But it is disruptive, right? And it does. It does disrupt uh, a, tra a traditional set of practices. I personally think they have to be, they need to be disrupted, but there's political upheaval with that. 
So Republicans, yeah. Yeah. They're, they're, they're not, you don't see them talking about uh, expanding public charter schools in rural communities they represent. So let's be clear. Um, nor, again, is there any organized opposition in their party. And so, uh, yes, we have a lot of work to do in the Democratic Party. However, a lot of the growth of, uh, in, in public charter schools has been in cities where Democratic mayors, Democratic school board members like myself. When I was mm-hmm. president of school board, I had people like this brother, right? I'm from Newark. That's my home. Uh, still live there, raised my family, love the city. Mm-hmm. It's been there 100 years. I'm dealing with people like this brother times, you know, 10,000 with all the conspiracy theories and you, uh, so, so you ran to be a volunteer school board member to do the white man's work, all this absurdity. That's what yeah. we have to deal with. Um, but but those same people had no energy because they're in, they're in every, every community. Like, you know, yeah. I, I went to New Orleans public schools. People seem to forget about pre-Katrina New Orleans. They don't understand what it is. But you got these exact same type of brothers who like to show up and show out about anything that changes what they had before, as if it was perfect, as if it was good, as if it would belong to the actual community and wasn't like something that needed changing. Anyways, don't get me started on that. But this is where I'm going to push back on you, Shavar, and, and give you a hard time just about the Republican part of it. Um, so the Republicans are offering in their in their in, to, in their total agenda, they're offering a lot of whatever. Let's just say that that they have a big agenda. But when you come just down to education, they've got very simple about education. Um, this, I think school choice is about as, as simple as they can make it. Mm-hmm. What you just said about it doesn't affect rural districts and it's not a, a, it's not a profile on courage for them to do that. I get it. But you have places like Arizona where like charter schools are a full state thing in Arizona. And it does affect mm-hmm. everybody because white folks are in charter schools. Middle class people are in charter schools. You have a meeting anywhere and you say, who's got a kid in a charter school? And I don't care what race or background you are or whatnot. You're likely to have a, a majority of hands go up. Cause that's Arizona, right? Very, mm-hmm. you know, uh, uh, right of center thing. And it does affect their districts there. Um, I think you're right about places like where I'm at in rural areas, you have superintendents in red, in red counties and red districts are still superintendents. They are still looking out for their own, you know, best interest. Mm-hmm. Um, um, but not all re- Republicans are for choice either though. Not all mm-hmm. Republicans want your kids showing up in their schools either though. <laughs> so, um, you know, they're private schools. Uh, so I think they have a battle on their side too. I mm-hmm. think ours is different just in, I can't get away from, whoever sells you, like when Malcolm X says, I'm for truth, no matter who says it. The idea that the money belongs to the student, it's called per pupil income, is something that is in dispute between the political parties, I think, right? Like the, the money should follow the child is in dispute. Um, yeah. What can we do, I think, on the democratic side to just get down to the fundamentals of talking about centering the child and not centering the building or the system? or the school, but centering the child in the middle of it and that child's money. Yeah, I mean, I think I think Democrats, um, we're likely to have um, a more balanced perspective on that um, because I think we're, we're more likely, um, whether it's good or bad, right? Because I'm not gonna make a judgment, but I think Democrats tend to be more, more thoughtful about the fact that um, few systems have served poor people well and even fewer systems, large systems have, have, have uh, served black people and brown people well at all. So just the idea of choice without more actually doesn't get you very far because mm-hmm. where are you going? Where are you going? And so there has to be some construction of the market, right? In other words, there has to be some, there has to be some floor and some um, vision around accountability to make sure that, that, that wherever you're going is actually gonna work. So I think Democrat, whereas you know Republicans can be a bit more just free market um, and can be a bit more unfettered markets, whereas progressives, Democrats, um, I think absolutely Democrats are, are generally uh, supportive of the idea of more options for people. But then you have to make sure that the options can actually be used in a place where it actually can lead to a result that's powerful and transformational. And so that's where you'll have more conversation about what providers in the market uh, must be accountable for. Right. In terms of results, in terms of enforcing civil rights uh, guarantees, you know, and that sort of thing. And so I think I think that because of that, um, it's not merely just the idea that the family, the parents have the money, uh, although I think that should be part of it. But that's not that. But that's not the, that's not um, that's incomplete by itself. They also have to think about make, constructing the market in a way where there's actually quality choices. And to be clear, for black people in particular, this is every domain. 
if black people could charterize police right now and create community-based safety solutions in their image, what do you think they would want to do? Of course they'd want to do it, right? Mm -hmm. Big mm -hmm. public housing projects didn't work for us. So that's where we got the community development corporations who were able to basically charterize public housing through CDCs where we could create public housing in our image. Um, big health, big hospitals oftentimes didn't work. So you got more very qualified healthcare centers where we could do that. Part of the issue I think where some black folk have concerns in the charter space is, it's really a space for black and brown people to recreate public education in their image. Uh, mm -hmm. But what happened was oftentimes black and brown run charters can access the capital to the same degree as some of the white run charters, the scale. And so in some of the public imagination, many um, uh, may view the public charters as a way for white people to come in and to colonize, particularly in certain cities where Black and brown people had just begun to get control over the school system. Like so, for, for a place like Newark, for example, through the through the black and brown political um, ascendancy uh, into the '70s and '80s, um, uh, black and brown folks began to assume political power and authority over the school system. Then the state took it, kind of right as we were um, uh, in political ascendancy, and then the charter schools uh, arose. So I think it's important to understand that context. So even the brother we talked about before, in that context, you can absolutely see this is a part of something else, right? This ain't really about kids, it's a part of something else, right? A person like me says, none of this stuff ain't never worked for us, so we gotta recreate something different, right? Mm -hmm. To be clear, mm -hmm. I'm not a, I, you know, I, I um, have a critique of some of the top-down ways of some of the charter sector. I have a critique that I've made to everybody in the charter sector about the fact that black and brown people running schools weren't often able to scale. You oftentimes had 25, 26 year old white kids coming in and getting millions of dollars to scale schools. Whereas you had 40 year old black and brown people who frankly were better educators on any objective basis, couldn't access capital, their schools couldn't scale. That's a problem, right? And that's a problem that's symptomatic of underlying white supremacy. So the point is, if we're thoughtful, we gotta have a critique for all of this. And then the question is, how do we how do we balance all of this in such a way that we can create a better uh, set of options for our families, uh, particularly families of color? For me, choice has to be a part of that, but also um, accountability has to be a part of that. Civil rights, equity, and guarantees has to be a part of that. Data so we can measure whether the students are really learning has to be a part of that. And I think part of what we have to do is get past some of the false dog dogmatism on all of these sides and say there is actually right and wrong in each of this stuff and we got to combine it to get to a better system do you um do you in your honest opinion when you go to bed at night and think about this because you're you're you are one of the only leaders i know that are out there in the democratic party side trying to be organized and civil and um and strategic and planful about how we discuss these issues and I think thoughtful. But do you think given the amount of rancor in the Democratic Party from the anti-choice um, traditionalist side, the side that wants the traditional education system to be the winner in all things, do you think that there's a place in the Democratic Party anymore for people that really are unrepentant reformers who 100% who buy two premises, the current and the old system, is not working and it hasn't been working for a long time. And two, it can't be the only game in town. Families deserve, if you live in an education des desert, you deserve something other than just the old main one traditional system that hasn't been working for a while. Are those two premises that a person like me could fit within the Democratic Party comfortably with? Sure. Sure. I mean, you have, I mean, uh, I think Barack Obama fits comfortably within the Democratic Party. He may be the most pow uh, popular, well, his wife is the most popular <laughs> Democrat, but he's right behind his wife. Um, he fits within the mainstream. Uh, I think Cory Booker, um, you know, fits comfortably within the party. Um, I think we have, we have, you know, I can go, we have 12, 13 senators uh, who support uh, the federal charter school program appropriation every year. Uh, we have a few dozen people in the House. Uh, we have mayors, we have school board members, we have state legislators throughout uh, the country. We have governors, um, prominent governors like Andrew Cuomo, Jared Polis, um, Gina Raimondo. Um, the, you know, there's, there's a large number of Democrats throughout the country. It may not be a majority, right, because I do think the majority uh, still will, for the most part, take its talking points from uh, what it is that the teachers unions want. And to be clear, I'm not also dogmatically opposed to anybody. The teachers union does a lot of great work but they also do some things that are problematic. But my point is there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of Democrats throughout this country, school board members, mayors, state legislators, governors, US senators, house members um, who support charters, who believe in both of those premises. 
Um, the press likes to focus on the food fight, right? So they maybe they don't get as much attention. Um, it's definitely an uphill fight. I'm not going to be um, Pollyannish about that. Uh, but there's absolutely a strong critical mass of Democrats who support these ideas. Um, and again, the bottom line is charters are disproportionately located in cities run by Democrats. Right, all this stuff I hear about the Republicans. It ain't, so sure, you can find an exception to the rule, Arizona, and maybe there's a, another couple states. But by and large, we're at public charter, school, uh, pu- uh, public charter schools in any meaningful numbers. It's Democrats who run the city. Mm-hmm. So who really, who really is carrying the water? And again, the Republicans have almost, they have no organized opposition. We have the strongest political force in democratic politics on the other side. And even in the face of it, you have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of Democrats throughout the country who have pushed this issue. Um, and in fact, where this issue is really um, has significant critical mass, it's in cities and communities run by Democrats. So I just think we have to reject uh, some of uh, what I would argue is mythology about there not being this base of Democrats who have been pushing this issue. You know, you have a president right now who is saying that if you look at the majority of Democratic run cities, cities run by Democratic politicians, that you have a um, you have a trend and a pattern of a crime and um, and he's using words like mob now and like, you know, so mm. his commercials are pictures about Democratic run cities being these bastions of badness, things that happen mm. that are, are bad. You just said that, you know, a lot of charter schools are in, in those same cities. Um, I think it's been an uncomfortable thing to talk about for a long period of time that some of the most defeated school systems are also in those cities. Um, which should open them up to more change. I think there was an effort at magnet schools for a period of time. There's been a, an effort at charter schools for like 25 years now. Um, what, what do you think could be the most logical path forward now to not just be making it about kinds of schools or whatever, but just about school improvement period, just improve the lot of all those kids. We have kids in all those cities Right. And you, you and I can go down the list, Chicago, Gary, Milwaukee, Oakland, you know, Los Angeles, Newark, <laughs> where you are. There are all these cities where we have lots of kids um, and it just needs to be about improvement. It doesn't need to be about one. You said dogma. I think that's important. It doesn't need to be, be about a dogmatic plan. But what's the logical path forward for improvement? Well, I think part of it is also I think it's important. Um, part of the reason so many of these cities um, have these issues with educational deficits is because these cities have uh, issues with a whole variety of deficits because they are constructed in a certain type of way, right? Mm. So we know that we know that because of redlining, right? So we know both in the public market and in the private market. So for example, we know that um, veterans administration loans, uh, FHA loans subsidized by the federal government just weren't uh, given to black and brown people. Um, and, and that's before you get to what private sector banks did. So the construction of um, the, what they, what's called the inner city and the construction of suburbs is a reflection of governmental practice, which is very much rooted in, in white supremacy and racism. Right? So, so, so that led to the disinvestment of resources uh, in these communities. Um, that led to the packing of black and brown, low income uh, folks uh, in these communities. All of this was exacerbated in the post-industrial age as the manufacturing sector uh, which propped up many of our cities, particularly our mid-sized cities. Uh, manufacturing was obviously disrupted by global trade and by the move of the economy from manufacturing to services. And so when you combine all that together, you have the construction of the inner city where there was disinvestment in the cities um, across a variety of do- domains, poverty accelerated. Then on top of that, you get to the 70s, heroin began to flood these communities. In the 80s, like North one from crack cocaine flooded, uh, flooded these cities. So we got to be clear that the schools operate within that environment. And so we absolutely, there are things within the educational domain that have to be different. Um, and I'm excited to talk about those things, but we also can't lose sight of the broader environmental and ecosystem rooted in racism, white supremacy that created uh, these inner cities. So when somebody like Trump, who may be the most regressive uh, white supremacist president we've had in modern times, talk about these cities in these negative terms, in large part, that's because they were constructed to be that way. And then the schools are just a symptom of those underlying issues. And so even as we talk about the schools, we got to talk about these broader issues. Within just the, the school bucket, there's absolutely things we can do to even make that space better, which, which we've done a lot of talking about. And I do think we need to figure out a way to have a political conversation that, that can do that. But also we have to connect what's happening in the schools to the broader underlying issues in terms of disinvestment in urban communities, 
um, the ongoing practice of redlining and race and race discrimination, which traps uh, so many black and brown folks uh, into these communities. So on one hand, it's nice to have choice. So if you're going to be trapped within that community, let's not just trap you in the neighborhood school. But also, it's also a, 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 in the broader scheme, uh, frankly, ultimately a narrow and incomplete conversation if we don't connect the kind of construction of the inner city into the broader set of remedies we need to really bring about racial justice for, for folks of color. So the question that I asked too about whether or not there's a home in the Democratic Party for people that are um, unrepentant about being education reformers in one shape, way, shape, or form um, also gets me to think about the, the Bernie side of the equation. So when there was a, a unity uh, committee put together, especially around education, uh, it was it was a Biden Bernie um, unity. So the unity was meant to bring together kind of the lefter wing and the centrists of the Democratic Party to form an education agenda. So what they are thinking through are things like community schools, um, a tripling of, of Title I money, um, um, supporting HBCUs, and um, reducing discipline, and thinking through, I think, things like uh, culturally responsive pedagogy. Um, what would be so wrong with just going with that? Like, what, what would be so wrong with that being 100% of the agenda without much challenge to it? Yeah, because that, that, again, all of that, I think, is good stuff, but it's just not enough, right? And so, clearly, there needs to be a reimagining of, I think about this you just named, there needs to be a reimagining of discipline, right? I mean, we know that's fed the school to prison pipeline. Um, Community-based schools, absolutely, is, is a positive idea. Tripling Title I, um, tremendous idea to have that many more resources, particularly in this COVID environment. Uh, but most of those ideas really largely involve um, money and investment, um, which, again, given the issues we talked about in terms of our particular inner cities and our rural communities, for that matter, we, we need more investment. But we have to demand uh, some results for that investment. Right? We shouldn't just write a blank check without demanding results. What we need is at the end of, of the things that we do, we need the children to be better off. And the bottom line is competition works everywhere in our society. Um, not without more, right? You got to construct the market and have some boundaries around, um, you know, having accountability for the providers in a market. Uh, but it's only when it comes to poor people that somehow we think not uh, having choice is a good thing. Uh, mm -hmm. Middle income people have been moving out of cities forever, uh, looking for better schools in the suburbs, um, in the cities. And we know this in places, um, uh, frankly, like Newark and others. If you're politically connected, you call down to the school board and your kid gets into a better school because you had a political relationship. Mm -hmm. But if you but if you were just a everyday person and you didn't know anybody and you have the you didn't have the money to move to the suburbs, you were stuck with whatever uh, your neighborhood school was, right? You didn't have the ability to choose. And so we believe that's foundational and fundamental, that poor people should be able to make decisions. And then these systems have to compete because also we have we have you know we have many of the charter options, frankly, that don't work. So we have families pulling kids out of those too. We're not, I'm not about one option versus the other. I'm about the family should have the power to choose because what happens is when they can choose, the system has to now respond more to parents. The system responds too much now, too much now in my judgment, to political people, to political interests, the teachers unions, the business community, the elected officials, the political machines, right? Whereas parents are, should be the ultimate and their children, the ultimate stakeholder. So they should have the ability to make the decisions about how educational resources are allocated. So the lack of focus on choice is, is a huge gap in what you just talked about, as well as the lack of focus on accountability, right? So it's really about writing the check, but there's not uh, a support for choice. There's not a support for accountability. That approach will frankly get largely more of the same uh, because it doesn't demand that these resources are used wisely and intelligently. Can you give me one second, bro? I got to charge sure. my phone. When I switch to the phone from the iPad to the phone, I actually have 2% left. All right. <laughs> you do that. that. <laughs> I'm going to go through the comments a little bit here um, and uh, see what's going on with our comments here. So uh, Kayla says, choosing the best education for your children shouldn't depend on nepotism, but it does. I was on a school board and I know that people call you in the middle Here's of night. the night. Some of the most like um, some of the most anti-choice people and politicians in the world are the ones who would call me and say, I need you to help me get my kid into the magnet school and jump hey, over no, the line. I need a block. Where's the block? Real quick. Um, no, me. So, uh, um, so there's that. You know, it shouldn't depend on nepotism, but it does. And, and we know that. Um, we have two or three schools in Minneapolis, for instance, where you have um, 
you have an unusual number of connected kids and and um, staff kids of staff of the district so um we also have Natalie saying, keep fighting Shavar, which I think is a, a positive, hopeful message. Um, patients says charter schools play a part within segregation by uh, selecting the good students, which is absolutely a lie everywhere. Um, charter schools have to be free and open to everyone. When they have too many families applying, they have to use a lottery to let students in. So it's a big lie that they get to choose. And again, I love how we always have this energy for charter schools, but we never have the energy for the fact that the traditional public schools pick and choose students by using a demographic uh, address, uh, a residential address, excuse me, and also by running magnet schools, some of which turn you away specifically because of your race or your test scores or your perceived ability. So there's that. Um, um, but we never have that type of energy. This is a problem with my people. We never have that type of energy for anything other than charter schools. Charter school does it. It has to be bad. Traditional school does it. Ah, well, you know, whatever. It's just, you know, at least that's my people getting the pension from that from that school district. Uh, Kayla says public schools discriminate against special needs children. Also, California as a district or as a state had 99 settlements. It had to settle at one time with the federal government. Uh, for harassing students or not uh, um, being fair with students who had special needs at the same time that the union paid organizers were trying to make a charter moratorium with this idea that uh, they were unfair to kids with disabilities. They were completely ignoring the 99 uh, um, federal government settlements that California had going on with traditional public schools. The entire state of Texas was busted their school boards were working with the law firm that taught school boards across the entire state how to deny services to special education uh, students that they were entitled to by federal law. And nobody said anything on the traditional public school side. I could keep going, right? If we want to play this game around, you know, charter versus district and, you know, they pick their own students, they do all that stuff. We could play that game, but you're going to lose. Because there's no way that you're ever going to come out ahead defending the traditional public school system for any of these discriminatory factors. I will beat you. So so come on my show. I'm open to all. Come one, come all. I'm open. You have an open invitation. You can argue with me about this, but I was on a school board. I can tell you all the ways in which a school board can deny you services, deny you access and entry, uh, make special routes into schools for mayors and sons of mayors and city council members and others, um, ways in which you can just, oh, it's just so weird that we have a school district that's 85% kids of color, but this one school has 90% white kids in it. Wow, that's just weird. I wonder how that happens. It happens because it's baked, inequity is baked in to the system. So anyways, Shavar, you're back again. You know, I had to like go through the comments a little bit and we had a little bit more of the same kind of unproductive stuff that comes from our community sometimes that doesn't move us forward. But it gives me this, this thought that I was gonna ask you before you went out about Democrats and, and uh, education agenda. So much of what we're talking about is a political um, argument around education. Like these are political matters. But there's just some bread and butter nuts and bolts. One of them is funding, and you mentioned that, and you're for that. So you're not against us getting resources into schools. That that's um, um, that that's an issue. Do you have any ideas? Since you are with a, a organization that believes in elections, believes in the civic process as a way to to get power, do you have any thoughts around things? Uh, um, like school boards, like the fairness of elections and school boards and getting representative power from the communities on those boards. And even something so simple, do you have an idea around, I mean, do you have any preference over things like appointed versus elected boards and that sort of thing? Yeah, you know, I, of course I was on an elected board in North. Um, and um, I think the theory of the, of the elected school board uh, sounds great, but the practice is very different. Um, so we definitely have in our city, and we're here to see this throughout the country, the idea of the school board as the most democratic way and where there's community power and that sort of thing. Um, school board elections, you tend to get four to 5% of the registered voters turnout. Um, and in our city, for example, we haven't had any competitive school board election in several years. Um, you know, and we see this in many communities where you know political uh, influencers will get together and they'll collaborate on, on teams and support candidates. 
And the problem is this whole idea of community control, the everyday parent really doesn't have the bandwidth to be a political organizer, right? Everyday parent is working a job, sometimes two jobs to put food on the table. They're coming home, uh, making sure their kids are doing their homework, make sure kids are ready for school. They go into their kids' bas baseball game, basketball game. They don't have time in the midst of all that to then be a, a political organizer. And the reality is those who do politics in our cities, these are paid people. They wake up and they do politics all day, every day. Mm -hmm. Right. And so mm -hmm. and so it sounds good, um, but then in practice, it doesn't make sense. So, so that's long for me. That's a way of saying I tend to support a mayorly appointed board because the mayor um, and there's issues. You can get bad mayors and all of that. But the but the mayor in most cities is generally elected by the largest number of people. Right. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, so if you're getting if you're getting five percent turnout in the school board races, generally speaking, you know, you may get to 20, 25, 30 percent, which still isn't huge, but that's, you know, that's five or six times more than you get uh, in the school board context. Um, and so I tend to prefer that, pre pre prefer that. And the reality is if we're going to move these systems, you're going to need strong executive leadership. Um, you can get bad executive leadership and that'll absolutely send things back. Um, but it's also beyond all of the political turnout things I talked about. It's hard to move these, having been a school board member, um, it's hard to have a superintendent who's going to be bold if he or she has to deal with nine school board members. Um, and for example, in our city, every year, three are coming up, right? So it's a rotation, right? And so in many communities will have similar models. And so you're going to piss somebody off if you're, if you're a strong superintendent. And the idea that every year you got to find yourself in an electoral context to defend what you're doing, that just sets up the system for what we've seen, which is um, inertia for the most 40, 50 years. So I think with a mayoral system, it's more representative of the people and the mayor can be a strong executive and then has to go back to the people over four years. So you get more room to operate. So that's kind of where I come down on that. Though. Um. All right, so we're getting closer to time, and I wanted to do this to you, put you on the hot spot. Sure. It's not really a hot spot, but um, so I'm a black voter. I'm a black person. I have three kids uh, still in traditional public schools in my traditional district school. I don't have a ton of options where I live or whatnot, um, but I do have an analysis. My analysis of public education is that it is the way that you set the boundaries the way that you designed where people can go and how they live or whatnot is a blueprint nationally. And to use your address as a way to decide what your educational fortune will be has always been one of the ways in which you can indict the public education system for purposely um, being inequitable and serving kids differently. Uh, groups like EdBuild put out a report that said white districts get more money on average than, than black districts. Um, that's not a flaw in the system. That's by design. I just said it's a blueprint, right? Uh, any logical person can look at the way you gerrymander districts is the same in politics as it is in, in, in education, right? Mm -hmm. So you're getting, but we're told to be loyal to this system and I'm not. And I don't, I actually don't care about being loyal to anything that logically an intelligent person can look at and say, wow, the blueprint here is messed up. This is on purpose doing this. So because I believe that way, I have to look for a presidential candidate and candidates who are, who are going to respect the fact that I'm an education voter. Some people are reproductive rights voters. Some people are civil rights voters. You know, you, you get what you get. Some people are tax voters. I want lower taxes. I want higher taxes, whatever. Help me understand. I know what the Republican pitch is to me right now. Help me understand what the Democratic pitch is to me as a voter, as a prototypical voter, I'm saying, right? Like I just gave you the persona, my profile. What's the pitch to me um, um, from the Democrats? Yeah, I mean, I would say the pitch would be, um, like I say, resource. The, the pitch of the Democrats I represent, um, you know, is resources plus innovation for plus results, which we think is a very powerful um, agenda to drive educational equity opportunity, uh, not only for low income students of color, but low income students and working families throughout the country rooted in standards and accountability, resource equity, reimagining teacher prep, public school choice, higher education. Um, even the agenda that the um, Democratic Party platform embodies. Um, and the pieces of it that uh, Vice President Biden and Harris have spoken about, um, to us is clearly a much more powerful and transformational agenda for kids and for families of color throughout this country. Um, tripling Title I, 
um, that's going to have a dramatic impact on working uh, families and working poor uh, communities throughout the country. Uh, because there isn't, at least now, the willingness to put as many strings on it, that means there's been an opportunity in local communities for people to organize and talk about how those dollars should be sent in their, in their communities. So you can vote for the president to allocate uh, three times more resources than you, than you fight in your local community about how those dollars are spent. There continues to be, maybe, perhaps not as robust as we might like, but there to, continues to be in the platform a focus on accountability and preserving um, uh, tests as a part of that accountability uh, framework. We would like, we would like, frankly, a more fulsome and robust affirmation of the benefits of accountability. So the rhetoric isn't where we'd want in the platform, but it still says we have to have some measure of test-based accountability. Um, we talk about Democrats, Congressman Bobby Bobby Scott, who's that, who runs the House Education Committee. He's not backing away on accountability as a mechanism to ensure civil rights. So that's where the Democratic Party will continue. Um, uh, to be. Um, as I said, there's hundreds and hundreds of Democrats uh, throughout this country who believe that there should be more choice and more options to move around. In fact, Democrats go as far where the Republicans never go about. We go into in inter-district choice programs as well. Many Democrats throughout the country support that, where it's kids and cities can go to school in the suburbs. Whatever choice the Republicans talk about, folks should be very clear. They ain't never talking about po uh, poor people and black and brown folks going to schools in their communities. They ain't never talking about that. So we should be very clear um, about that. Um, and again, most of these Republicans talk about choice. They talk about in other people's communities, right? So sure, can you find a couple of states here and there uh, where there's something broader? Maybe, but for the most part, they're talking about choice in cities that don't deal with their communities, right? So, so understand that. And then the bottom line is the top of the ticket, the Republican Party, um, uh, those Republicans who are embracing uh, the per current president that we have um, are embracing perhaps the most racist, regressive, president we've seen in modern times. Anybody who wants to delude themselves to think that agenda, even if you get a little bit more charter school, um, is going to be better for low-income families, low-income families of color. As far as I'm concerned, they're smoking something. Um, and so, uh, <laughs> and so, so may, and even, and, and frankly, even on the charter issue, that's become a debatable because he wants to block grant the program. Uh, so in his most recent budget, he wants to block grant the charter school program, mm -hmm. which in many mm -hmm. states would mean the program be zeroed out. So I don't even know I don't even know if that was the only issue somebody wanted to vote on. I don't even know if that would still be a candidate. Um, but on the broad, even on the on the broad educational equity agenda, which is beyond just the charter school issue, um, it's all it's about affordable college. Working families can't afford to send their kids to college. It's about making sure they have an equitable shot at college. Um, it's about leveraging sixty billion dollars in increase in Title One to help begin in local communities uh, to transform uh, K twelve. It's about preserving the accountability. People should be clear. The Republicans were with the, t the the hard right Republicans were with some of the teachers unions in backing away from accountability because they didn't That's want right. the feds telling states what to do. Right. right. And so um, I spent most of my day pushing my party um, to be better. Um, and I and I enjoy that work. And it's part of uh, you know, my vocation. But at the end of the day, the Democratic Party has been a party for working people, for poor people, for people of color. We have our issues. We're not perfect. But on balance, I would argue that the choice should be crystal clear uh, for those who care about not only educational equity, but broader issues of racial justice in terms of what they need to do in November. Excellent. Well, I think that's the best pitch you can possibly make. I am still up for grabs. Uh, <laughs> I'm not that, confused, that, that though. That pains my heart, especially in Minnesota. That's a battleground state. That hurts my heart to hear that. We're not really a battleground state. I don't think we are. I, people I, people I, think I, we are. Statistically, people think we are. I, I, but I don't feel it. Maybe, well, I don't know. I can never say never. I think in 2016, some of us said never, and uh, and look what happened. So, um, so I... I am ready to be surprised this time around. When I say I'm up for grabs, I'm, I'm not up for grabs between uh, Democrats and Republicans. I'm up for grabs between voting and, and voting for sanity. Like first time in my life, I'm considering the fact that all of this system is so broken that I can't endorse any of it. But what you just laid out for me is a lot of what I can agree with. Um, educationally speaking, it's a common sense agenda in a lot of ways. I wish that there were more black people involved I wish that when we talk about things like unity tables and tickets, that there were more black people involved. Um, and I wish that there was a way to say, regardless of what you like in policy, parents are making choices on their own every day and you should honor those. There are 8 million black children waking up every day going into schools and their parents are making different choices and you should honor all those choices that they are doing. Not the ones that you poll, do polling on or any of that. What are they actually doing? 
right, with their kids and you have to represent them. Um, but I appreciate you as always. Number one, you're one of the smartest people I know. Number two, I think you look at this issue um, from so many different angles and you try to um, find a thoughtful middle ground. Um, and also, as we have seen in the comments here today, you, you take uh, a lot of arrows um, from folks who aren't doing much, but want to um, want to create a boogeyman and whatnot. And you have to, you know, you have to live with that and whatever. You're probably a lot, a lot like me in that case or whatnot about like, if they're not talking about you, you're probably not doing anything worthwhile. So absolutely. You you know. me. No, absolutely. I mean, that's, you know, if you're going to lead and want to, and look, this is disruptive work. I mean, I'm very proud of, we disrupted, uh, things not only in Newark but in other communities. And when you want to disrupt things, there's gonna be there's gonna be a lot of pushback. There should be pushback. Mm -hmm. I don't have a problem with pushback. I'm mean, I don't necessarily like uh you know non-factual um stuff. But on the, on the other hand, that's politics, right? People in politics, yeah, that's politics. It's much harder to 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 um engage in the substantive conversation. It's much easier to start calling people names. And we learned yeah. that in third grade. To start calling people names, that's the easiest way to to, to polarize folks. Well, some of us learned it in third grades. <laughs> you know, some of us went to the wrong public schools and were forever ruined and end up on on, on my feed saying stuff that don't make sense. Um, anyways, uh, Shavar Jeffries, president of uh, Democrats for Education Reform. I appreciate you coming on today and to join us. You are a very busy person. Um, nothing but uh, love and respect to your family for allowing you to do this while you were on vacation. It's uh, um, I, I don't take that lightly. I appreciate you, man. Uh, okay. and all the work Thank that you, you do. Thanks for having um, me. Um, anytime, please come back. Uh, you guys put out a report or anything that you think is important uh, to get out there. Please come back and let's talk again. Um, for the people who are watching, um, this is a forum. You're all welcome to come and you're all welcome to say what you want to say. And I welcome the pushback and, and the, like, listen, mix it up chop it up. Um, that's the way democracy works. That's the way these things are supposed to happen. Um, Mott Mize, who, who, who brought some of this heat and this energy into the comments today, you're welcome to come on the show too, right? I can guarantee you this. This is what I can guarantee you. I can guarantee you a fair discussion that is based on facts as I see them and as you see them in a form which we can be intelligent Black people and we can have it go back and forth. What I can't offer you is a forum where you will say things like Republicans came up with charter schools and not tell you that you are lying because I live in Minnesota where the charter schools were born and everybody in the room when they were born were Democrats. And I can name them for you and I know them personally. So you can say these type of things, but we need to have an intelligent conversation about it. You can say we're paid by white supremacists. Again, you can say whatever you want to say, but you need to be an intelligent black person and bring it onto this show and don't punk out in my feet. Hit me up, bro, you know how to get to me and let's have this conversation. Don't be a punk, be an intelligent black person. Let's come talk about it. Anyways, peace out to everybody. I love you for coming every morning and watching and giving me this hour of your time. Let's be intelligent people, not just intelligent black people. Let's be intelligent people and human beings and let's have a civil discourse around the issues that matter most. Our kids are not trapped in good situations. Our kids are trapped in situations that don't deserve them. So let's work together to make something better come out of that. I thank you all. Love, peace.